Hi, welcome to the signal pad. In this episode, we're going to do another repair, and this time I'm going to take a look at this Agilent 53152 a Now this is a pretty high frequency, frequency counter. It goes all the way up to 46 gigahertz, and that is split between two inputs. Channel one goes from 10 hertz to 125 megahertz, and channel two goes from 50 megahertz to 46 gigahertz. So it's a pretty specialized unit because of its high frequency operation. And this also is actually a power meter as well, so it's capable of measuring the input power coming into the unit, so it's pretty good. And these are very expensive uh, when they're working. This is the A-Revision, but even the A-Revision, uh, we're talking thousands of dollars. Uh, I bought this broken, of course, for about $650, and again, the reason I can buy these and do these repair for you is because of my Patreon supporters. So I really want to thank them and whoever is continuing to support me. I'm almost at the second goal of the Patreon page. So take a look at it. The link is at the bottom of the video. And of course, subscribing and all that always helps. But the Patreon supporters are really carrying the channel, especially for these repairs, because as you know, these things are pretty expensive. So anyway, so the problem with this particular unit is that it doesn't power on. And uh, so it could be any number of things. Of course, we're going to start with the power supply and check that. And uh, if you look carefully here, if you don't recognize this connector in the front, it's because it's not a traditional connector. It's actually a crown planar connector. Uh, I think it was invented by a German company. And unfortunately, the adapter that goes in front of it uh, to convert it to, let's say, you know, 2.4 millimeter or 3.5 millimeter connector, that's missing. Uh, it didn't came, come with the unit. I did order one from eBay from somewhere else for 20 bucks, which was pretty cheap. And um, yeah, it hasn't arrived. So we're going to have to find a different way of applying signal to it if we actually get it to power on. So I'm eager to try it out and uh, see what happens at the back. It's not that exciting. Let's turn it around here and see what we're dealing with. So at the back, of course, we have uh, GPIB. Uh, this one does not have a couple of the options that are available in units like this. You can get it with a battery, or you can get it with the oven time base. Now, not having an oven time base is not a big deal. I'm sure we can install one afterwards ourselves. And here's the power input and, of course, the, uh, the line-in. Now, you may also think that this external DC it's convenient because you can just try the external DC input instead of trying the AC. But unfortunately, the external DC is only enabled and functional when there is the battery option. Otherwise, it's just basically bypassed and it's not used. So we can't use it uh, for that. And if we had the battery option, then this would come out and a battery would be fitting into the air. So I expect this to be mostly empty uh, inside uh, because of that. And uh, yeah, anyway, so should be pretty interesting to figure out. Now I'm going to just directly uh, go ahead and, and take it apart and take a look inside of it. Uh, the reason is because normally uh, when a unit doesn't turn on, it's good not to plug it in uh, to avoid further damage, uh, especially if it's, you know, it's got some power supply issue. If it's already damaged for some reason, let's not make it worse. So let's go ahead and, and figure it out. Turn up, uh, I was going to say turn it on, not turn it on, and uh, take it apart and see what happens. All right, here we go. I took the top off, and it is disgusting on the inside. It's got a whole bunch of these uh, residues all over the place. I'm not sure where they're coming from, but they don't seem to actually really rub off, so they're probably pretty old. And uh, I can see the back of the LCD, and the front panel also has quite a bit of dust on it. And this has a fan, so air is blowing in here or out, so it's no surprise that there's going to be dust in there, of course. And there's a couple of uh, sections here. These clips are supposed to hold these cables in. Now these clips are missing and that's kind of worrying because uh, the only reason they would be missing if somebody opened it. Uh, otherwise why would they be missing? They should be at least still inside of the unit. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. It looks like someone might have had at least an attempt at this and I hope that they didn't cause too much trouble. Now the other thing that was really surprising was when I opened it, this fell out of it. This thing. And uh, that's, of course, also troubling, because why the hell would this be in there? And I take a quick look at it, and this might be a Hall effect sensor, and uh, which makes it <laughs> even more unusual why they would have that in there. Uh, but uh, I hope that it is not from this, and if it is, we better find out where it came from and uh, find out why it's off and why how to replace it and so on, if, of course, it is a Hall effect sensor. Now, other than that, it's uh, pretty straightforward on this side. I have taken these off. These, of course, were connected. And on this side, the AC line coming in also, I disconnected it. So the power supply is really modular, and it's on its own. That's pretty straightforward. It's from the integrated power divisions. And uh, I think I've seen this before, uh, this brand before, in many of the other Keysight and HP equipment. HP typically doesn't make their own power supply. It's pretty common uh, that this is the case. So nothing unusual on this side. The AC line coming in has a very nice uh, filter on it. This is a pretty good quality one, has fuse and everything built into it, gives you a fairly clean AC line going in. So no surprise there, and this is the GPIB cable, by the way, and this is, of course, the front panel cable. So nothing unusual, and so you may ask, well, where are all the circuitry? 
Well, it happens to be that everything's on the other side. Let's flip that. And here we go. Look at it. It's quite beautiful with a blue uh, silk screen. And uh, it's a nice color, but it's not the nicest thing to work with because it's hard to see the traces. I haven't seen a blue silk screen on a Keyside instrument for some time. Or maybe I have and I just don't remember. But other than that, uh, very nice and clean. We've got an area in here, which is the power management area. So if you had a battery, uh, some of these connectors would go to the battery and back. And this is where the 12-volt line comes in. This fuse is for the 12-volt line, which is unused in this case because it doesn't have the battery. Everything else is uh, very nice and cleanly laid out. We've got a couple of Xilinx devices. This might be, if, uh, what is this? Um, this is uh, some maybe the processor or the GPIB controller. Not sure. I have to take a closer look at it. And uh, we have two of these firmware ICs. Sometimes they split them into odd and even bits. It might be the case in here. But either way, it doesn't matter at this point because it doesn't even turn on. We've got a potentiometer in here, which is actually a calibration potentiometer. You can access this from outside of the unit. Uh, there's a hole on the side of the case to adjust it, so it could be useful if it works. And you can see some cages to protect some of the more sensitive uh, components that are under these areas. Now, interestingly enough, there is, of course, room for some other cages to be installed, but they haven't put the cages. Maybe they didn't need it. But uh, we can also see some labels that says what these things do. So we have some clock buffer section over here. There's a PLL section here. There's a VCO section here. So it's a VCO is underneath this. There's a V2F converter, voltage to frequency most likely. And then we have a signal conditioning portion over here and something else in here which says IF amp. There's an IF amplifier here. Now, if you go and look uh, and watch my other frequency uh, counter repair video from some time ago, I describe exactly how it works. And it's really quite amazing how they make this work. That one was with a step recovery diode and a comb generator. And I suspect that this might be the same, but I haven't, I haven't actually checked. So it should be pretty interesting. Take a look at that. There's a quite a bit of learning uh, involved in that one as well. And then uh, we can figure out how this works later on and if it uses the same principle of operation. But for our purposes, what we should do, we should start with this power supply and see if we can get it to work. I can connect the AC line to it directly, measure its outputs, and see uh, if it did actually puts out the right voltages. Now, the service manual for this is available. But it has no information about the circuitry at all. It's just very basic, shows you which are the components, which of these modules go where and how to disassemble it. Really not very useful for what I wanted. And it also tells you how to calibrate and check its performance and so on. Uh, but other than that, I couldn't find anything when I did a quick check through it. But it does tell you what the voltages of this power supply should be. So we can check that fairly easily. And I'm going to probably take the top of it off and measure from there without connecting it, of course, to the unit. So it should be a good, good place to start. And I'm eager to see what happens to it. So let's go. All right, first thing first, let's see if the AC line is actually making it to the power supply. It's the easiest thing to check. And that would check all these, uh, all the connections here at the uh, input of the filter and everything as well. So we can easily do that. And um, I've connected it to my, directly to my installation transformer. I've set it to 122 volts there. But in reality, you could potentially lower it uh, for safety. In fact, you know what? Let me do exactly what I'm saying. So let's go ahead and, and set it to something that's not lethal in case we make a mistake. Let's say you know, 39 volts AC should be good. If you're ever working with these things, please be very careful. I have said this many times. These things are lethal voltages, and it does, you know, takes a mistake to, to be quite bad. So just be very careful. And of course, use proper uh, leads like this ones. So let's go ahead, and we're going to turn this on. So let's turn this guy on first. There we go. And turn this on. Well, so far, so good. Doesn't seem to be consuming any power. So I should be able to measure at the input of this guy my 39 volts. There it is, about 40 volts. So the AC line is indeed uh, making it into the circuit. And that's good. But of course, we'll have to check to see if something is coming out. Now, uh, for the purposes of setting to see if any voltage is coming out of these guys right there, I'm going to have to set the voltage back up to 122 volts just to make sure that it is in the right range. So let me get that uh, switched up over there, and we'll measure those voltages. All right, here we go. So it's wired up now. Now, just to give you a couple of information, it's turned off right now. now. A couple of information here is that this power supply generates three different voltages. It can give you minus 15 volts, plus 15 volts, and plus 5 volts. And that's distributed among these outputs over here on this connector. And right now, I've wired it to measure the plus 5 volts, which is the most basic output of this, you know, running all the digital circuitry, for example, on this machine. And everything is hooked up, and this is on DC voltage. And you can see there, I have it set to 120 volts on the variable isolation transformer. So let's turn it on and take a look. And there. And 
nothing. So nothing is coming out, of course, and uh, it's not generating anything. Let me turn it back off. Let's measure a different one. So we want pin 5 and pin 6. So let's see. Here is pin 5. And here is pin 6. There. Let's see if there's anything coming out of there. No. Absolutely nothing. You know, it's interesting to see absolutely nothing come out. Um, because normally when you see so little activity on a power supply, on a switching power supply like this one, I would have suspected fuse be gone. But I'm looking at the fuses. There's two fuses on there. And none of them are dead. Now let's turn it off and turn this off. And take this out to be really, really safe here. And uh, let's figure something out here. So I, w I want to measure this. And of course, being in here, it doesn't make it very easy. So I think probably would be best to take it out of this and put it on the table directly. And then in, you know, away from all this, away from the metal and all that, and use the isolation transformer and have it in a nice controlled way. That way I can also flip it upside down and see what happens. Now, looking at this, it looks like it's going to be a bit of a work there to get it out. But I think that's the way to do it. So I won't waste your time. Let me get it out and take a closer look at it. All right, here we go. Excuse me while I get this cat to get out of the way. Go away, Pooch. I'm trying to do something. All right, so there's a power supply. I took it out of the unit. And as you can see, it has a very simple architecture. This is a basic switching power supply. We've seen quite a few of these. So I'll just skim over it very quickly. And you can immediately tell what kind of things could be wrong with it. So here's the line input. So these guys can go all the way up to 220 volt. This is rated all the way to 220. And there's our 275 volt uh, AC rated capacitors there. You can see a couple of fuses which are all intact. Here's our main bridge rectifier right here. And here is some common mode transformer and inductors. And here is our main storage capacitor. This is going to be right after the bridge rectifier. After that, we're going to have our main transformer, our main switching MOSFET, which switches the transformer. Here's the IC, which does PWM control based on the feedback from the secondary, or it could be a, a third coil in the transformer. And this IC is going to obviously do the feedback control and adjust the PWM in order to get the correct voltage on the secondary port of the transformer. Here's our opto isolator, which separates the two halves of this power supply. And everything on this side are DC regulators. There's a potentiometer here to adjust to 5 volt. We have three voltage regulators on here, which will give us the three power supply voltages. A lot of filtering on the DC side. And if I look on the other side, you can clearly see where the isolation happens. So this gap over here separating the line section from the DC output section. You can see some discoloration here due to the thermal aging of this device. Uh, obviously, it's been on for quite some time. And uh, other than that, there's really not much going on. There's a bunch of other little components here and there. But the main functionality of it is quite easily captured. There's also a voltage reference over here. So um, if you see absolutely nothing coming out of here, there's a few possibilities. Well, the first possibility is that this is dead. Um, I'm a little bit reluctant to think this is dead because normally when these MOSFETs die, they tend to die short, not die open. Uh, but if it is dead open, then it means that the PWM being generated by this IC is simply not switching this, and therefore we have no activity on the other side. But we can do some quick measurements to see, for example, if this IC is getting its own power supply. And we can measure the output of it with a multimeter, even you even need, need an oscilloscope, to see if it is um, having any effect. Because if it was, let's say, a PWM signal, yeah, your instrument will tell you some, you know, some intermediate voltage. You can even measure its frequency with a multimeter. But I want to use the absolute minimum tool uh, to, to fix this. So we can go ahead and try that. Other than that, there is really nothing going on on this. Uh, that's of any you know unusual thing and and uh, normally when you fix this if you repair any of these you'd want to for example replace all the capacitors because it's old and so on but uh, I don't have that much patience I just want to see if it uh, runs because really this is just a stepping stone to see if the frequency counter itself is working which is what I am interested in otherwise these power supplies are cheap so let's go ahead and, uh, and try just to make a quick couple of measurements then we will see uh, if we can replace these, I would start with replacing the main IC if it's not working, and this even if it is working, because the MOSFET's pretty old. So that's a good place. Let's go ahead and uh, do some quick measurements on it. 
All right, let's do some measurement on this. So I have set my isolation transformer here to 20 volts, nice and safe, and I can go ahead and enable it. And I have then connected the output of that directly to this power supply. So it's nice and safe for touching, nothing is gonna go wrong there. And I've marked it neutral and live. And there's no earth in this case. And um, anyway, so that's one thing that maybe you'd wanna do, maybe put earth on it. But anyway, for this case, it's okay. So let's see if we do have our AC voltage appearing on the terminals there. So Let's go ahead and measure that. What do we have there? There you go. You can see we have about 21 volt AC and no DC voltage sitting at the input of this power supply right now. And I'm on the low Z mode, so low impedance mode, just to make sure that I don't measure any ghost voltages. And I get both my AC and DC voltage. Now, if my bridge rectifier is working and my fuses are okay, I should be able to catch the DC rectified voltage of this on this capacitor. That means that this portion of the circuitry is at least okay. That includes the common mode transformers, the capacitors are okay, protection circuitry is still there, and so on. So let's go ahead and flip this guy and do a measurement. So we expect to see, you know, 1.4 times the 20 volt minus the drops and the rectifier to be there. So let's see what we have there. And there you go. I have it backwards. Let me just do it correctly so we don't see a negative number there. Here we go. There it is, so no AC voltage and 26.7 volt DC sitting across our big capacitor there. Everything's good, not a ghost voltage, and it's indeed there. So that is pretty helpful and means that that portion of the circuit is functional. Nice and easy test there. And again, that's why the isolation transformer is so handy. I can, I can touch this without being worried about it, which is very important. So now the next thing I would like to do is to show you the block diagram of this IC. Uh, because first of all, we want to learn what it is that we're trying to replace and fix. And then also it will reveal its pinouts. So we can go ahead and measure the pins directly. So let's go download that and take a look. And here is our part, as you expect, it is a current mode PWM controller, which is exactly what we were expecting to find. And it has a couple of interesting features. Obviously it's intended for DC to DC converters. This is the heart of this power supply which drives the transistor which ultimately then switches the transformer. It has a low startup current of less than a million which is pretty handy. Now, this is important because when you initially start the power supply there is no voltage reference and there is nothing created yet. The power supply hasn't gone into closed loop operation yet so it needs to first wake up and this device needs to wake up and then create the PWM and start the oscillator and make sure the feedback is compared correctly and so on. So it needs to start up very quickly and with little energy as possible. And this is why this low power consumption at the startup is pretty important. He has a couple of other interesting uh, features. He has pulse by pulse current limiting. So every time a new pulse comes out, it is checking for current problems as well. So you can limit the current on a per pulse basis. It's very fast reacting. And also it has a 500 kilohertz operation, which is very reasonable. And you can read through it and all the other things. But really you just want to get a quick look at this block diagram to make sure we understand it. So let's go all the way down. By the way, here is this uh, footprint. You can see we're using the dip package, the 8-pin dip, dip package. It also comes in an SOIC, which I don't have. Let's go down. Where is our block diagram here? It was here just a moment ago. Ah, oh, there it is. Here's our block diagram. So let's take a quick look and just get a quick idea here. So obviously it's going to need a VCC and a ground. Now VCC and a ground need to be generated when you turn on the power supply. So there's some Zener protection on it so it doesn't exceed a certain amount. And then there is an internal 5-volt reference uh, with an enable pin connected to it. So just to ensure that there is no under voltage condition happening, we have this hysteresis block over here to make sure that this 5 volt reference isn't being bounced around and is, is predictably correct before it is engaged. And this is why it's important to make sure because otherwise you may, may be in this kind of semi-stable mode and you think you're generating the correct reference but you actually aren't. That's what this is uh, protecting. And there's also a reference pin over here. And I, Probably looks like you can overwrite the reference or monitor the reference. Not quite sure, doesn't really matter. Uh, what is important here is that there is a VREF good logic portion. It means that uh, it's monitoring to make sure the VREF is meeting the requirements. And if it is a good VREF based on its logic, then it will only then will it out enable the output driver. So we have a nice emitter follower output portion over here. You can see there's two bipolars. The emitter one is grounded, the collector, the other one is going to the VCC there, which is going to the uh, capacitor. And you can see here that uh, we can uh, directly drive a MOSFET from this output or with some simple logic. Oh, let's get rid of that. 
So, uh, and, and you can see here is there's a, a logic at the input of this, meaning that there are several conditions which are required to meet before the output actually toggles. So our PWM latch, which controls the width of the PWM, is part of this logic. The oscillator is going to be part of this logic. And by putting these into an OR condition, uh, you can get the output driver to be the way you want. So this is very common that they create a bunch of logic states and they compare them in some way and they perform some uh, logical arithmetic on it before they put it onto the output driver. Very common stuff, nothing unusual there. You can see you can control the oscillator frequency by using external RC, uh, RT and CT components. Again, quite common. And here's our feedback point and here's our I sense point and you can see both of this information is used to ultimately control the PWM latch. So this is where the feedback happens. The output here drives the transistor, the voltage is generated, goes all the way back over here, gets compared to this, and this is the closed loop system. That's why this loop is so critical. And there's a whole bunch of you know current uh, sensing and so on built into it. Really nice and easy block diagram. So for us, the quickest way to test is just to see, make sure this VCC and ground is actually reaching our IC, and then take a look and see if we have a you know proper output coming out of it. And if it is coming out of it, then we will go ahead and uh, replace the transistor. And if it is not, we replace it. I'm tempted to just replace both of them because they're old. And I just want to make sure I have a nice new components in there. And I will put this on a socket as opposed to soldering it directly onto the power supply. But let's go do a quick measurement and then we can go from there. All right, back to here to do more measurements. Now, this time I've set the isolation transformer to 94 volts, which is the lower bound of where this is supposed to operate. So now it's quite dangerous, got to be careful. And I'm going to measure between pin number five and pin number seven. That's the power supply of the PWM controller. And let's see what we, uh, we find out. Oh, it looks like my multimeter is running out of battery there. So let's see, what was I saying? I was saying pin number seven. That's pin number seven and pin number five. And check it out, we have power supply, which means that our PWM controller is getting a reasonable power supply of 15 volts. Now, is it putting out anything on its output? Now, output is pin number six. So I'm going to put this on pin number six, like so. And I'm going to put the ground right next to it. And no, I don't see anything, nothing. Interesting, so nothing is coming out of the PWM controller which makes sense because if there was something coming out, we would see some activity from the power supply. So th I think that chip is dead. It's a good place to start. And let me go ahead and turn this off. And remember that these com capacitors can be charged, so just be careful. And uh, let's go and take some of these components out. I'm going to also take out the MOSFET. Uh, the reason for that being, let's say the MOSFET has also died, which may be the cause of the death of the PWM controller. Let's change them together just to make sure there is uh, nothing going on. And then we can power it back on and see if it survives that. So I went ahead and I replaced the defective components. And now the behavior of the unit has changed a little bit. Uh, it has some dynamic activity, which it didn't have before. But the dynamic activity is on the wrong pin. Now I see it on the power supply. So let me show you what's going on here on the oscilloscope, because then we can talk about tracing the problem and then figuring out what's going on. So let's power this on and take a look. All right, so I'm set up to do some measurements here. I've connected the isolation transformer back to the power supply. I've also soldered the wire to the negative or the ground terminal of the PWM controller. Now that happens to be the same as the negative terminal of the main capacitor of the power supply, right after the bridge rectifier. I've also soldered the cable to the positive terminal of the power supply. And as we measured before, this portion of the circuit is fully functional, no problem there. Now remember that I have an isolation transformer on my AC line here, so I have no fear of connecting the earth ground of my oscilloscope to any of the voltages here. You have to be very careful because if you don't do that, some of these voltages are with respect to the earth ground and then you could short the whole thing and you can damage your oscilloscope or the circuit or cause some havoc. So be very careful with this. As always, isolation transformers are a very good idea for these reasons. So let's go ahead and turn it on. I, I have it set to 100 volts, uh, so not quite as high, but 100 volts is well within the specification of this power supply, so we should be able to do some measurement. So let's go ahead and look at the power supply that appears on the PWM controller and look at its behavior. So here we go. Here is our oscilloscope. And let's zoom in over here and see what we find. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look. Here we go. I'm just going to look at the 15 volt power supply of the PWM controller. Let's put that on and check it out. 
this is interesting. So you would expect this to be sitting at a constant 15 volts. And I can kind of make some guesses on what's going on here. So it looks like that the power supply of the PWM controller rises up. So now the PWM controller should go into a startup condition. We discussed that earlier. But as soon as it gets into a startup condition, it's going to draw some current from our whatever power supply node that is on this circuit in order to be able to you know, start and charge the capacitors and start some activity on the PWM controller. But as soon as he wants to do that, the power supply seems to collapse. And then it waits a little bit, because a couple of cycles over here, and then it rises back up again. So it means that the PWM controller seems to shut down. And as soon as it shuts down, of course, there is no current draw anymore. So the power supply rises back up again. And once it reaches a steady voltage, it starts again. And it's doing this at about 16 kilohertz. So it looks like that something is wrong with the portion of the circuit that provides the power supply to the PWM controller. Now, we can verify this in a different way. So I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the oscilloscope. Now, everything's still powered on. So let's go back over here and take a look with the multimeter here. So with the multimeter, we can go ahead and measure the power supply voltage that is sitting on this PWM controller. So that should be pretty straightforward. You see, I have it on volts there. So let's go ahead and measure. First, let me measure the voltage uh, across the capacitor, just so you can see that, indeed, there is sufficient voltage there. So here we go. What do we see? We see 140 volts. That's to be expected. This is correct. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on the negative terminal, which is the same as this wire that was hanging out here. So I'm going to put this on the negative terminal, nice and solid. And I'm going to go ahead and measure the power supply voltage on the PWM controller. Remember, this is a DC voltage. Let's go ahead and measure it right here. And you should see, you know, there's about 14 and a half volts. So it's taking the kind of the peak voltages because the power supply spends most of its time around 15 volts. So it's measuring 14 and a half. But now let me go ahead and put it into the low Z measurement. So here now we have a much smaller impedance being represented on the multimeter. So if there's a ghost voltage or if there is a voltage on a node which has a very high impedance, which is not good in this particular case, we will be able to catch that. Now let's go ahead and once again do exactly the same thing and measure the same thing. And what do we see now? Uh, if I can get it on a bad angle here, check it out. It goes to 4.2 volts DC. So as soon as I load that node, the voltage collapses. So something is wrong with the circuitry that's providing the voltage to that PWM controller. So let me go ahead and turn this off. And let me go ahead here and measure this guy so I can discharge this capacitor. There you go. You can see it discharged completely. So yeah, there's something going on. So we can go ahead and follow that trace and find out what component it goes through. And we can measure that component. Now, I actually have done that already very quickly because it was pretty straightforward. Let me show you which component that is. Now, one of the components it goes over is this uh, diode over here. And this diode, I think, is a Zener diode because I can measure the voltage across it. And we can find out how much voltage is, is keeping across it. Now, it looks like it's a 15 volt Zener diode. So let's go ahead and flip it back up. Let's go all the way out over here. And let's go ahead and measure the voltage across the Zener diode to see if it is a 15 volt Zener diode or not. I'm going to go ahead and enable this. Going to go ahead and put this onto low, uh, low or high, Im high input impedance voltage measurement there. Now, if I can find out where that was, I think it was across from here to here. And there it is, 14 and a half volts. That's actually sitting directly across that Zeno diode. So maybe that is the issue. Maybe this Zeno diode has something has happened to it. There it is. That's our Zeno. You can see I'm measuring right across the 14 and a half volts. So maybe there's something wrong with that. And uh, there is another test we can do. We can actually use the oscilloscope and look at the voltage across the Zener diode as a function of time and see if it changes. Uh, because it's a Zener diode, it's reversed biased, obviously, at its Zener voltage. I would expect that voltage to be fairly steady. So let's go ahead and do that measurement quickly. Let me get that set up. So I was about to remove this Zener diode and take a look at it on the source meter to plot this IV characteristic. Then I thought, let me check one other thing before I do that. And the purpose, obviously, was to see if the resistance of the uh, Zener diode in reverse bias voltage was stable or not. So instead of that, I took a little bit closer look and find out where the decoupling capacitor of that particular power supply created by the Zener diode was. Because as with everything, of course, because this 
capacitor goes through a large resistor before it hits the Zener diode, you need something to stabilize that power supply. So when you draw a current from it, it's not going to fluctuate too much. And I found that this capacitor here is part of that circuitry. And I was trying to measure it, and I was getting some weird results. And I went ahead, and I removed it. This is actually a replacement capacitor here. I just put it in just now. And uh, this particular one, this particular one, have very close values. This is 22 microfarad, I think. This is 27 microfarad. Anyway, pretty close to each other. So we can go ahead and measure this and find out if this capacitor indeed is defective or not. And this, you know, there are many ways to measure this. You can use anything. I'm going to use this um, ESR meter, which is a pretty straightforward one. And let's go ahead and take a look. I'm going to connect it over here. I'm going to connect the other node over here. And let's do a measurement on this bad boy. Here we go. What do we see here? Analyzing. So first of all, they couldn't even measure the C, and the ESR is very bad. So indeed, this seems to be a bad capacitor. Now, this is a good sign in a way, because this bad capacitor would certainly cause that power supply voltage to be completely unreliable and vary quite a bit. So now we, we've gone ahead and replaced it. Now let's go ahead and measure the power supply voltage and see if it is stable when we use our multimeter in the low impedance mode. So here it's got multimeter once again. I'm going to connect the negative terminal of the multimeter right over here. And here's our positive terminal. Let's go ahead and power this guy on and see if we have a stable voltage. So back to this guy. Remember that when we were using the high impedance mode, we were getting a nice steady voltage. I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. So let's measure that power supply once again, being very careful not to kill ourselves. Here we go, 14.7. I was seeing that before also. Let's go to the low impedance mode and measure again. Ah, much better, 13.8 volts, that is a good sign, meaning that the power supply voltage is most likely now quite stable. So uh, it's pretty exciting. We can go ahead and measure it, or we can go ahead and directly go to the output. Ah, you know what, while we are here, let's measure the voltage, let's measure the activity, just to make it complete and say that we did everything. So I'm going to measure the power supply voltage, so let's go ahead on the scope once again, and Let's go ahead and measure this. So I'm going to go measure the power supply uh, voltage. And, oh, it's on AC mode. That's not what we want. Look at that. Not too bad. And if you pay close attention, I see some spikes in there. That is a good sign. That might be activity on the uh, PWM controller. So let's look at the pin number four. And if there is any activity on the VWM controller, I see a few things there. What about the output of the PWM controller, which is pin number six? And, ah, there we go. That is a beautiful sign. There it is. So indeed, our PWM is actually working and it's generating, you know, some pulse width, uh, whatever that is. It's around 44 kilohertz. It looks like maybe about 10%, and which makes sense, 10% or uh, maybe even less than that. And the reason that makes sense is because the power supply has no load. So obviously, the PWM duty cycle is going to be very small because it doesn't need to put a lot of energy directly to the output because there's nothing loading it. So this is actually a very good sign, and it could potentially mean that we will have some outputs over here. Now, whether this portion of the circuit is working and all the other things are working and this switching transistor, which I actually already replaced anyway, and if everything's working, we should be able to see some voltage. So now we can go ahead and measure the output. I happen to remember that. We're going to do this all in one take. So here's a negative terminal, and we can connect our negative terminal, which I think was, sorry about that, I need to remember where these pins were, if I'm not mistaken. Pin number, uh, pin number, sorry about that, I shouldn't be doing this live, I know. Pin number eight is ground, and pin number eight is here. Okay, there we go, here's our ground. That's nice and easy. And we can go ahead and measure the other uh, nodes and see if we can get our power supply voltages. I'm very excited because I can finally actually test the frequency counter as opposed to this uh, useless circuit. There we go. Let's get another cable. Let's plug that over here. And let's take a look. I am excited. Here we go. Do we have 5 volts here? And 5.4 volts. Beautiful. It is generating power exactly as it's supposed to. Quite happy with that. Let's see, now we should also have minus 15 volts. So plus 15 volts is on pin number five. So we should have plus 15 volts here. And there it is, 15.8 volts, looking good. And finally, minus 15 volts should be the last pin. Do we have minus 15 volts? So that's the last pin. And minus 15.1, and it is on the low Z mode, so it's definitely not a ghost voltage there. Looking very good. Now, the five volt power supply is not the 
closest to 5 volt as I was hoping. On the data sheet here, it says that it should be within plus and minus 1%. So yeah, it's not that bad, but we can go ahead and fix it. That is pretty easy to do. Let's adjust it using this. I'm supposed to be using a non-conductive one, but uh, good enough. Let's see if it's working. Oh, I'm increasing it by mistake. 5.4, 5.3, 2, and 5. Point oh, no, I see. It's taking, <laughs> it's taking a while to settle because I'm drawing almost no current from it. So that's why I overshot it. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and adjust this. I won't bore you with it, but as you can see, this potentiometer is clearly uh, reacting to that. So it is about 5 volts. I'm going to keep it there. So let's go and put it back in the unit and see if it comes back to life. Should be pretty interesting. All right, here's the moment of truth. I'm going to flip the power at the back of the unit here. I've already obviously put the power supply back in there. Here we go. And, ah, the green light is a good sign. So obviously the standby is working. Here we go. Okay, very nice. Testing, soft test, okay, beautiful. A whole bunch of numbers. GPAB address 19 and <laughs> it looks looks okay so far. So yeah, it's quite quite nice. Uh, it seems like it powers on, and uh, that's a good sign. So we're going to have to put some signal into it. Now, I actually did receive uh, my planar crown connector from eBay in the meanwhile, but unfortunately, it seems like it's missing uh, the inner ground. Now, I'm not sure if that's supposed to be there 100%. I don't use many planar crown connectors. I don't think anybody does. Uh, but anyway, uh, so it, this one is uh, missing that, and uh, so I think this is probably fallen out, or maybe defective, or maybe this just a higher frequency versions simply don't have that. But either way, uh, it should be good enough for our purposes, so we can go ahead and connect this bad boy right over here. Oops. And uh, let's see if this fits properly, and yeah, looks good. There it is. So uh, we're going to be able to put some signal in it. Now, obviously, in testing channel 1 makes sense first, because it's a low frequency one, can go up to... 825 megahertz. We can easily check that before we move to the high frequency. So let me close this back up, back to some uh, re you know, respectable state, and then we can do some frequency tests with it. So it also turns out that this fan is absolutely dead. Uh, it doesn't spin, doesn't have any life in it, and you can hear, I don't know if you can hear how bad it sounds. So yeah, th this needs to be fixed also. It's a 15 volt fan or a 12 volt fan, and I checked that there is indeed a power supply present on it. So yeah, I have to change the fan also, and this probably explains the thermal failure of this unit eventually, uh, because it, it, it when once you plug it in and turn the back switch on, and this fan actually is always spinning. And this is kind of uh, the design, because if you have a oven-controlled oscillator, you want to kind of stabilize the temperature inside of this also, and it's always active in order to keep everything up to temperature to increase the life of the uh, crystal, as well as the fact that it will be up and running when you turn it on. So anyway, I have to find another fan for it. For our purposes, for our testing, it's not necessary right now, but if I have something, I'll replace it. All right, and we have a fan replacement. It was a little fan that I had lying around that taken out from some other component. I can't remember what. But anyway, now we're good. 12-volt fan, ready to go. All right, let's do a couple of quick measurements and see what we get. So let's ch use channel 1 first and make sure that one's functional before we move on channel 2. And on channel 1 here, I have my synthesizer set to 100 megahertz, so it should be well within channel 1. And let's go ahead and change the channel to channel 1. There we go, and there's no signal, so let's go ahead and turn it on. And what do we have here? There we go, not too bad, 100 megahertz and 104 hertz. Now, uh, obviously, this is going to have some offsets from 100 megahertz, and this is going to have some offset because of its 10 megahertz reference, which is obviously now not in spec. So that can be adjusted. There is a little potentiometer that you can adjust. I can do that adjustment later. It's not a big deal. We just want to make sure that it is functional. So I'm pretty happy with channel 1. I don't think there is any issue with it. We can go ahead and set it to its upper frequency range, which is 125 megahertz, and you should be able to measure that. And we can see that it measures that without any issue. So that part is working. So let's go ahead and disable this. And the uh, channel 2 actually starts from 50 megahertz, which means that we should be able to measure this 125 megahertz once again and do the same test now using channel 2. So let's go ahead and disconnect that. We're going to connect an SMA cable over here to this guy. Uh, let me make sure this is making a good tight connection here. This cable is actually a type K cable. And it's a little bit difficult to, to tighten here because of the angle I'm sitting. 
and it should be good enough. There we go. Perfect. So now we can go ahead and change to channel 2 and turn this guy on. And what do we have here? There you go. Perfect. 125 megahertz and 131 hertz. I should be able to go and enable power measurement. There's our power measurement, and it says it's been measuring minus 0 0.2 dBm. This is set to 0 dBm here, so there's a little bit of a loss in the cable. That seems to be about correct. Now, if I go down in power, let's say to minus 10, we should be able to measure minus 10. Yep, you can see it's nice and linear dB going down, so it's fairly accurate. No problems there. We can go back to 0 dBm here, and it works fine. So let's try a higher frequency. Let's set the frequency to 1 gigahertz. Here we go. That's 1 gigahertz. And not bad. There it is. 1 gigahertz and 1.043 kilohertz offset on that. So this definitely needs to be adjusted and recalibrated. The power is a little bit lower now because the loss of the cable is more. But it seems to be fairly reasonable. Let's try all the way. The highest I can do with this source is 6 gigahertz. And wait for it to settle down. And there is our 6 gigahertz, and you can see there is 6 kilohertz, uh, 6.249 kilohertz offset on it. So that needs to be certainly adjusted. But not too bad. The loss has gone uh, more, obviously, because the cable has more loss there. But it seems to be uh, nicely functional. Now, I wanted to upgrade this and put a rubidium source reference in it. There's a lot of space in it. Or you can put a really good oven-controlled uh, crystal there. So we can do that in a different video. It should be good enough for now to get this going. I, I have a bunch of other things I need to take care of. But uh, yeah, this is, I think, a pretty good and simple repair. Gives us an idea on how it works. And I'm, I'm going to come back to this again in a different video to all, do all the upgrades and have some fun with it and do some modifications on it. But so far, so good. Again, thank you for all the Patreon supporters. Uh, please uh, subscribe to the channel. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment and let me know what you think so we can plan our next activities on the channel. I'm trying to see if it's ever possible for a channel like mine to actually hit 100,000 subscribers. Uh, it's going to be very unlikely simply because of the type of content and the duration of the video. is just not compatible with a large audience. But I'm hoping that uh, with the smaller audience and the longer videos and more technical content, that it is still quite beneficial to the people who watch it. And uh, thank you for all you guys for being here. I'll see you soon.